Hello everyone, welcome back to this session. So before listening to this session, I would like you all to see the session on the white matter of cerebrum part 1 so that you will get an idea about the fibers. So in this session, we will be dealing with corpus callosum. So before moving on to corpus callosum, uh, have you ever thought how your brain uh, learns some information? Suppose if you are uh, trying to learn to write A with your right hand and sometimes if you get a cut wound on your right hand and if you are given a pen on your left hand, I, will you be able to write the letter A with your left hand? Yes. You are not training your left hand to write A but still if there is an opportunity or if, if there is a demand to do that job, you will be able to do the same job with your left hand but not with that precision because you are not training your left hand but still you know how to do it with your left hand. So how is it possible? You are not training your one side to do that but uh, you are training only one side to do that. But still the information is carried to the other half of the body. So how is it possible? So that is made possible by a set of fibers that is what is meant by corpus callosum. So that's an introduction to corpus callosum. So we have seen that there are mainly three sets of fibers in the white matter of cerebrum that is you have the association fibers, you have the commissural fibers and you have the projection fibers. Among these three fibers, the commissural fibers are the fibers which connects either the identical or non-identical part of the cerebral hemispheres. So you have a one region in one cerebral hemisphere, that region is connected to the opposite cerebral hemisphere through a set of uh, white matter, the white fibers, they are the commissural fibers and you have many types of commissural fibers, you have the anterior commissural fiber, posterior commissural fiber, habenular commissural, hippocampal commissural, so likewise you have many commissural fibers out of which the largest one and the most prominent one is corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum, the fibers are mainly the axons of the pyramidal cells of the cerebral cortex. You have the cerebral cortex with many different types of neurons and the pyramidal cells are actually having the axons and their axons are actually passing through the corpus callosum. Now uh, the corpus callosum is actually a large bundle of uh, white matter and it is said to contain about 300 million nerve fibers and can you just imagine the traffic of impulses passing through this large bundle of white matter and this traffic is actually maintaining the function of the both cerebral hemispheres. Uh, now uh, we will see uh, the corpus callosum under main three headings that is one we will see the external features of corpus callosum then we will move on to the parts of the corpus callosum and then finally we will discuss about the functions of corpus callosum that is how I am planning to deal with this topic. So corpus callosum uh, is a set of commissural fibers connecting the two cerebral hemispheres and if you see this is actually the medial section of the brain uh, of the cerebral hemisphere. So before moving on to the uh, corpus callosum as such, I would like you all to know some basics of the uh, brain. That is each part of the brain like if you take cerebrum, if you take cerebellum, if you take the uh, brain stem, every part of brain is having a cavity inside. So cerebral hemispheres, the two cerebral hemispheres, the cavity inside the cerebral hemisphere, you call it as lateral ventricle. Then between the thalami, you have the third ventricle. If you take uh, midbrain, you have the cerebral aqueduct. If you take pons, medulla and cerebellum, they are sharing the cavity known as the fourth ventricle. So this is just uh, to give an overview of the cavities enclosed by these uh, parts of the brain because uh, when we talk about corpus callosum we will come in detail about uh, the boundary formed by corpus callosum that is it is actually forming a major boundary for the lateral ventricle. So we now know that uh, the cerebral hemisphere is having a cavity inside that cavity is known as lateral ventricle and I will just give you an overview about the parts of the lateral ventricle at this point. The lateral ventricle is having an anterior horn, a body, a posterior horn and an inferior horn. These are the major four parts of the lateral ventricle. I will be uh, doing a session on the lateral ventricle soon, hopefully if you get time. Uh, 
So uh, lateral ventricle has got mainly four parts, the anterior horn, the body, posterior horn and inferior horn and this is actually seen in each lobe of the cerebral hemisphere. Suppose if you take the frontal lobe, it is the anterior horn. If you take the parietal lobe, it is the main part of the body. If you take the occipital lobe, it is the posterior horn. And if you take the temporal lobe, it is the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. So this is just an again an overview of about the lateral ventricle within each cerebral hemisphere. Now let's see about the uh, corpus callosum. So you have, you, all of you have seen the two cerebral hemispheres and you know that these two cerebral hemispheres uh, are connected in the midline, isn't it? So when you try to separate the two cerebral hemispheres, you can see a fissure in the middle. So suppose uh, these are the two cerebral hemispheres lying close to each other. You can see a longitudinal fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres that is known as median longitudinal fissure isn't it median since it is seen in the midline longitudinally arranged hence longitudinal and the fissure is known as median longitudinal fissure so suppose if you try to separate the two cerebral hemispheres you are not able to separate it what is the reason so when you look deeper into the median longitudinal fissure you can see a band of white matter connecting or bridging the two cerebral hemispheres that band of white matter uh, is known as the corpus callosum. So you can see a band of white matter bridging the two cerebral hemispheres at the floor of the median longitudinal fissure. So that is the reason why you are not able to separate the two cerebral hemispheres. Once you make a cut in this band, you can easily separate the two cerebral hemispheres. So uh, if you uh, look at the medial aspect of the cere uh, cerebral hemisphere, this is our corpus callosum okay so you can see a curved band of white matter roughly 10 centimeter in length and you can see that it is the anterior end is actually about 4 centimeter away from the frontal pole this is the anterior aspect this is the frontal lobe and this is the occipital lobe okay so this is the anterior aspect and this is the posterior aspect so when you look from the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere you can see that the anterior end this is the uh, curved band of white matter okay the cut section so this anterior end is roughly four centimeter away from the frontal pole and the posterior end is roughly six centimeters away from the occipital pole now if you have a look you can see that the it is convex upwards and it, it there is a concavity in the inferior aspect isn't it it is convex upwards and there is a concavity in the inferior aspect so now you're looking into the gap between the two cerebral hemispheres so before seeing the corpus callosum the white band you can see a thin band of gray matter Okay, a thin band of grey matter covering the corpus callosum and that thin band of grey matter is known as inducium grisium. Okay, inducium grisium. So, the inducium grisium, gyrus fasciolaris, all these are actually forming part of hippocampal formation that is limbic system. Many of you have asked me to do a session on limbic system. So, according to my time, I will be doing all these things. I love to do this. So, for the time being, if you just separate the two cerebral hemispheres before seeing the corpus callosum, you will be getting a thin rim of grey matter that is inducium grisium. And if you just think this as inducium grisium, okay, over the corpus callosum, uh, and you can also see four bands lying, four longitudinal stri or four longitudinal band of white matter in the inducium grisium a and they this bundle of white matter you call it as medial and lateral longitudinal striae medial and lateral longitudinal striae so over the inducium grisium running longitudinally from anterior to posterior aspect you have four lines imagine four lines over this uh, inducium grisium which is a thin strip of grey matter so these four lines the medial two lines so if you imagine these as four lines the medial two lines you call it as medial longitudinal striae and the lateral two lines you call it as lateral longitudinal striae and they are actually connected to amygdala
so indusium grisium you have then you have the medial and longitudinal lateral longitudinal striae embedded in the indusium grisium so sometimes this indusium grisium along with these striae are collectively known as supracallosal gyrus because it is lying above the corpus callosum right so this band is actually considered as supracallosal gyrus and uh, you have the anterior cerebral artery you have the anterior cerebral artery winding around it like this this is how the anterior cerebral artery is uh, arranged so if you again uh, separate, try to separate the two cerebral hemispheres you will be seeing the two anterior cerebral arteries uh, taking the curve of the corpus callosum so on the indusium grisium you will be seeing the two anterior cerebral arteries so these are the structures which you will be seeing just above the corpus callosum in the gap between the two cerebral hemispheres that is in the median longitudinal fissure so if you if you are planning to take a section like this okay if you just take a section here and if you remove this part and you are looking from this aspect if you take a section you keep the two cerebral hemispheres like this if you take a section like this and if you remove this part and if you are looking from the anterior aspect this is the view so this is the right and left cerebral hemispheres you have you can see the corpus callosum bridging the two and over that you can see the indusium grisium this is the indusium grisium and you can see the four bands that is medial and these two are the medial and the lateral ones are the lateral longitudinal striae and above that you can see the cut sections of the anterior cerebral artery okay so this is the view if you take a section at this point now above this uh, so that is the, this is the view which you see when you try to separate the two cerebral hemispheres and if you are looking at the medial longitudinal fissure okay now if you look at the medial aspect of the brain or the cerebral hemisphere just above it you can see a gyrus isn't it just above the uh, corpus callosum you will be getting a gyrus this is known as cingulate gyrus cingulate gyrus and this cingulate gyrus is actually separated from the corpus callosum by a sulcus lying in between this sulcus is known as callosal sulcus so callosal sulcus cingulate gyrus all these are features seen on the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere whereas the indusium grisium uh, the medial lateral longitudinal striae the anterior cerebral arteries are actually seen on the corpus callosum which is actually forming the floor of the medial longitudinal fissure so that uh, you have you have to keep in mind and all these are features of the upper convex portion of the corpus callosum now if you look at the lower aspect the concave aspect what are the features you can see a band of white matter here this is the phonix okay so this is the phonix so you can see that the corpus callosum is actually connected to phonix by a thin strip that is known as septum pellucidum septum pellucidum so septum pellucidum is a thin lamina which connects the inferior aspect of the corpus callosum with the phonix that point also you have to keep in mind now uh, let's move on to the parts of the corpus callosum so when you talk about the parts of corpus callosum it has got this portion is known as the rostrum this portion this bent portion you can see a bent here isn't it this is known as the genu this main portion the main bulk this is the trunk or body of corpus callosum and the posterior broader region the thickest band is known as the splenium of corpus callosum okay so you have the rostrum you have the genu then you have the trunk or body of corpus callosum and then you have the splenium of corpus callosum now let's see how are they contributing uh, to the uh, boundary of the lateral ventricle so we have mentioned that the lateral ventricle is a cavity in the cerebral hemisphere this is the frontal uh, lobe 
Hence, you have the anterior horn of lateral ventricle here. This is the parietal lobe. So, you have the uh, central part or the body of the lateral ventricle. Then this is the occipital lobe where you get the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. The inferior horn is actually seen in the temporal lobe. But for the time being, the band of corpus callosum is not actually forming a boundary for the inferior horn of the uh, lateral ventricle. But the fibers running from the uh, corpus callosum, which are radiating from the corpus callosum, do form a boundary for the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. But for the time being, we are more concerned about the anterior horn, which is in the frontal lobe, the body, which is in the parietal lobe, and the posterior horn, which is seen in the occipital lobe. So the band of corpus callosum is actually forming boundaries for all these three parts of the lateral ventricle. Now we can see that the rostrum is actually connected to a thin band of again gray matter that is the lamina terminalis, ter lamina terminalis. So this is the lamina terminalis which is actually seen as the anterior boundary of the third ventricle. This is the thalamus and the hypothalamus region and the cavity between the two thalami this is the region of third ventricle right. So this lamina terminalis is actually coming as the anterior boundary of the third ventricle and this rostrum is actually connected to this lamina terminalis. Now what about the uh, contribution of the rostrum to the anterior horn? It is actually forming a part of floor of the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. And now comes the genu. So this is the anterior horn here. So this genu is actually forming the anterior boundary of the anterior horn of lateral ventricle. And the remaining part, the trunk. The trunk or body of the corpus callosum is actually forming the roof of the mainly the central portion of the lateral ventricle and the splenium, splenium actually uh, hangs over, this is the thalamus right, the pulvinar portion of the thalamus, this is the pineal gland and this is the tectum of midbrain. So the splenium is actually hanging over these main three structures. You have the thalamus, you have the pineal gland and you have the tectum of midbrain. So this is midbrain, this is pons and this is medulla, right? So this is the tectum of midbrain. So the splenium of corpus callosum is hanging over the thalamus, especially the pulvinar portion of the thalamus, the pineal gland and the tectum of midbrain. That is how we explain the different parts of corpus callosum. So once again, you have the rostrum which is connected to lamina terminalis. This is actually forming the anterior horn, uh, floor of the anterior horn because here you have the anterior horn, here you have the body of the uh, lateral ventricle in the occipital pole you have the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle and in the temporal lobe you have the inferior horn of lateral ventricle. We are not talking about the inferior horn of lateral ventricle right now. We are just mentioning about the anterior horn body and posterior horn. Uh, in the anterior region you have the rostrum forming the floor. The genu is forming the anterior boundary of the anterior horn and the rest of the portion is actually forming the roof of the uh, especially the central part of the lateral ventricle and you can see the splenium actually hanging over the thalamus, the pineal gland and the tectum of midbrain. Now if you carefully look just below the splenium, just below the splenium you can see a lateral fissure. Okay, so there is a fissure just below the splenium and this here you get the tela choroidea with the posterior choroidal vessels and the great cerebral vein of gallon, posterior choroidal vessels and the great cerebral vein of gallon. So this is known as the lateral fissure just below the splenium and here you have the tela choroidea with the posterior choroidal vessels and the great cerebral vein of gallon. So this is again a neurosurgical landmark. And one more point, the medial and lateral longitudinal striae is also, they are also acting as a neurosurgical landmark during sectioning of the corpus callosum. So that will actually guide you towards the corpus callosum. So that's about the uh, rostrum, genu, trunk or body of corpus callosum and then the splenium of the corpus callosum. Now uh, let's see how the fibers are radiating from the corpus callosum. Uh, we have mentioned that there are commissural fibers connecting almost 
all regions of the two cerebral hemispheres except two regions. The, uh, two, the two regions are the primary visual area and the primary somatosensory area of the hand and foot. So these two regions are not connected with commissural fibers. That point you have to keep in mind. And uh, the corpus callosum is actually a band of white matter which connects the neocortex. That, mean, that is the reason why this is actually a big band of commissural fibers compared to the other re, uh, commissural fibers like the anterior commissure, posterior, hippocampal, habenular and all. So the corpus callosum is the main band which connects the neocortical region, the mostly evolved part of the brain. So that is the reason why this is actually a bigger band. Now let's see how the fibers are radiating uh, from this corpus callosum. So we have the rostrum, we have the genu, we have the trunk and we have the splenium. And from these the fibers are actually radiating to either side uh, to connect the different regions of the cerebral hemispheres, right? So now we are going to take a section like this, okay? You just take a horizontal section like this. If you take a horizontal section, you will get a part of the anterior horn and you will get a past part of the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. You have to keep that in mind. You, you are passing the section so that you will get a section of the anterior horn as well as the posterior horn. So I will show you uh, the horns first. So this is the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle and this is the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. So you are taking a section, horizontal section, so that you get a section of the anterior horn and you get a section of the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. Now uh, we will see the fibers, how are the white matter uh, radiating from the band of corpus callosum. From the rostrum, uh, actually from the fibers coming from the rostrum it's not included in this section they will be actually going to the orbital cortex of the frontal lobe okay on either side they will be connecting the orbital cortex of the frontal pole or the frontal lobe now uh, from the genu portion from the genu portion you can see that you uh, there, there there is a fork shape band of white matter. The, wi the white matter is actually uh, arranged like a fork. Okay, can you see? So this band is known as forceps minor. This is the forceps minor. So forked, a fork shaped band of white matter extending from the genu anteriorly into the frontal lobe. You call it as forceps minor. Now, coming from the main part of the corpus callosum, that is the trunk or body of the corpus callosum, you can see the fibers radiating on either side uh, in an extensive manner, mainly connecting the rest of the frontal lobe and the anterior portion of the parietal lobe. So, you can see all these fibers running almost parallelly on either side of the cerebral hemispheres mainly to the remaining frontal as well as the anterior aspect of the parietal lobe. And these fibers are actually intersected by the corona radiator because the corona radiator will be the projection fibers and they will be actually running at right angles to these fibers. These fibers are actually running horizontally, right? Whereas the corona radiator fibers will be actually passing uh, vertically. So these fibers, the Band, the fibers which are running from the body of the corpus callosum to either cerebral hemispheres will be intersected by the corona radiator fibers. That point you have to keep in mind. Now coming to the splenium of corpus callosum, you have the bundle of fibers passing to the occipital lobe as the posterior part of the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe and to the temporal lobe. That is how you get the fibers radiating from the splenium of corpus callosum. Out of these fibers, some of the fibers which are going to the occipital lobe, like the fibers which are going to the frontal lobe, you have some of the fibers arranged like a fork-like manner and they are going to the occipital lobe. This is known as forceps major. Okay. So you have a bundle of white matter radiating from splenium and they are more uh, going to the occipital lobe just above the calcarine sulcus. You have the fibers radiating posteriorly into the occipital lobe 
in a fork like manner that is known as forceps major and uh, one more point here you have to remember is the fibers which are actually radiating towards the temporal lobe can you see this this special bundle is known as tapetum so tapetum are a bundle of white matter passing to the temporal lobe and the peculiarity of this tapetal fibers are almost most of the fibers radiating from the corpus callosum are intersected by corona radiator fibers except this bundle that is the importance of the tapetal fibers the tapetal fibers are not intersected by the uh, corona radiator fibers that point also you have to keep in mind then uh, at this point i would like to add one more important thing this forceps major and the tapetum in between you can see the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle right so this forceps major is actually forming an elevation in the medial aspect of the posterior horn and this elevation caused by the forceps major is known as the bulb of forceps major okay so the bulb of forceps major is just an elevation caused by the bundle of white matter that is the forceps major in the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle so this is how we have the fibers radiating from the corpus callosum. So that's all about the parts of corpus callosum and the pattern of fibers radiating from the corpus callosum. In the next session, I will be dealing with uh, the functions of corpus callosum. Thanks for watching.